recovery program. If you know anybody who struggles, uh, tell them to turn in. It's around 6, 6.30, somewhere in that area. It'll be posted on uh, Oak Grove Assembly of God's Facebook page. If you're not friends with us on that, don't ask me, but some of these people out here teach you how to share it and become members of that page so you can get fed while you're at the house. Wednesday nights we do a Bible study at 6, 6.30, 7, somewhere in that area, but it will be posted on there. Before we get in, uh, before we come online Thursday night, Little Wayne's been doing an outstanding job on Thursday nights. I think seven o'clock is what he normally does it on. So for all the youth, it, I know it blesses his heart to tune in and uh, listen to him. And uh, we're here on Sunday mornings live for drive through. Hopefully they'll open it up. Uh, we got an idea that you know if they do open it up to try to kind of stay the distance for a little while till it all gets back to normal. May go to the new fellowship hall. There's a lot more room in there. We already got this equipment. So we can set it up in there and kind of spread out is what our plans are. But just be in prayer that this thing will leave our country. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to St. Luke chapter 14. Once again, I'm going to have to kneel and read. St. Luke chapter 14, going to begin reading in verse number 15. I feel like this is what the Lord has laid upon my heart. St. Luke chapter 14 verse 15 reads like this. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited many people. Verse number 17. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they, with all, and they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Somebody shout excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to, I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry, somebody shout angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Somebody shout room. Amen. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Somebody shout filled. Amen. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Pray with me today. Father, I thank you for the privilege and honor, Lord, to be able to preach the gospel. I pray for your anointing, Lord, to be upon my lips, upon my ears, Lord, that I might be able to make the right choices of the words that I say. I've only got a small box of time, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'd help me use words of quality, not quantity. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts the message that you've laid upon my heart, that I may give birth to what you've proceeded in my spirit this week. God, I pray for the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak. My heart may be filled with love. If there's anybody here that's lost and undone without your son, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would come by and draw. I pray, God, that you would deal with the hearts. Lord, as this word goes forth, it does not return into you void, but it accomplishes that which you please, and it prospers in the thing where you send it. Most of all, give us your good grace, God, as we go through this message, God, to be able to feel your presence. Lord, it's always an honor to feel when the third man of the Trinity comes by and touches our heart. We give you all praise. I pray for the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak, and my heart may be filled with love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise for his word today. I believe the Spirit of the Lord would have me to entitle this message. I, don't, I didn't come up with this message. I feel like the Lord laid upon my heart. He wants to ask us all a question today. Did he do all this for nothing? Friday night, I went to sleep, and I, I was changing some tires Friday evening. I don't know if I pulled something. I don't know what happened. But Friday night, about I'd say about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up with a sharp pain. I didn't exactly know what was going on, but I knew to wake me up, it had to be pretty bad because I don't I sleep through a freight train most time. I'm a heavy sleeper. But as I woke up with that pain, the first thing that I began to want to do is to try to figure out what was going on with me. How many hates to go through something when you don't know what you're going through? Amen. And all these computers and these Googles have just ruined us. We'll try to search it and try to find out and diagnose ourselves. You know, we all doctors when it comes to our bodies being sick. We want to diagnose ourselves and Man, when I woke up, I didn't know what was going on. But the first thing I heard the Lord say when I began to try to turn to other, other things in this world to try to fix my problem 
I heard the Spirit of the Lord. I've never heard the Spirit of the Lord but two or three times very clearly. And I hear Him from Him often, especially when I get messages. But there are times, and I'm not going to say it was an audible voice, but I did hear Him clear in the Spirit realm speak to my heart. And He gave me a message. I had been seeking God for a message for Sunday morning. And He gave me a message, and the message was entitled this. Did I do all this for nothing? And some people may say, what is this? And as I began to listen to what the Lord was saying, He began to show me a, a sermon that I've already preached before in the times past. And I would like to go back today and, and to touch on some of those same things and tell you what the Spirit of the Lord was telling me this was. Because the Bible says that He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes... We were healed. Amen. And, and as I began to think about this, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Spirit of the living God, began to touch my heart. And He says, you run to Google to find out what's wrong with your body. People run to doctors trying to figure out what's wrong with their bodies. But what happened to the man that hung high on Calvary's hill? What happened to the people that believed in divine healing once upon a time? I want to tell you that error seems to be none left to us. The divine healing is our last resort. When I come to tell you the Spirit of the Lord said today that divine healing should be our first resort and we're getting to a place in our life where we're going to need divine healing. Amen. And I laid there in that bed and I, and I began to repent in my spirit because I turned to Google first to try to figure out what was going on with me. And I laid there crying in my spirit. I said, Lord, I don't know what this pain is, but you know all about it, Lord. And I know that you went through pain that I might not have to go through it. You was wounded that I might be healed. You were beaten that I might live joyful. You, you were stoned and you was rejected that I might have peace that passeth all of the understanding. As I laid there crying in my spirit and I began to repent and ask God to touch my body. I got up and got a drink of water and I have you to know that that pain left me and as not been back since I'm telling you a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us there's many people may ask today brother Brandon I've tried to seek God why come God don't heal me I believe a lot of times we seek God but we look to man's hands to bring it in I believe today that God uses man but I believe that so many times we've gotten so far away from the divine healing power of the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ that we're automatically looking for a pill bottle. We're automatically looking for a medication and I'm not against those things. If I have a headache, praise God for an Advil. But Jesus said, tell my people not to forget that I am the Lord thy God that still healeth thee. I've not changed Jesus Christ. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed the old timers church, I, I come to tell you today, he's still healing today. Praise God. And I heard that message, Brother Larry, laid upon my heart. Brother, that makes a pastor sorrowful. When you're supposed to have the faith of the church, the church is supposed to be riding your faith. You're supposed to be a shepherd. You're supposed to lead, and the church is supposed to follow. But there's been too many times that I've been a failure. Amen. There's been too many times that I've laid there and could have done better. Can I get an amen today? Have you ever felt like you could have done better for the Lord? You might have could have had more faith for the Lord. You might have could have prayed a little bit longer, stayed up a little bit later, sang a little bit louder, shouted a little bit louder, danced a little bit longer, preached a little bit longer, done what you could for the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I feel like that many times that I'm a failure. And I will agree today that I am a failure. But He's not the failure. And He's that's on the inside of me. And if He be for me, who can be against me? Did He do all this for nothing? It's a question to ask yourself. As we read in the Scripture today, no doubt, I believe somewhere or another along our lives, we've all experienced this from a, from a time point that maybe... It was your child. Maybe it was a birthday that you've prepared for. I thought of all types of people. Maybe you've put together a work week. Maybe you've been to school. I, my heart breaks this morning before the seniors of this year. They went 13 years of hard labor in school. Now it's their time to shine. Now it's their time to flip their tassels, the tassels. And it's now their time to, to flip their caps. And now it's the time to wear their caps and their gowns. But... 
For some reason or another called the coronavirus, we can't do it. It's a time that they've prepared for, but they're not being able to do it. The same way Jesus has prepared the people of the world. He said he invited many, he begged many, he bidded many to come to his supper that he had. I'm, I'm thankful, I believe Jesus was a country boy. Some folks may think he had a little city slicking in his blood, but he called it supper. Uh, city folks call it dinner. Some of y'all get that on the way home. Some of you never heard it called dinner. We call lunch dinner. <laughs> but Jesus had bid many to his supper. He said he had a great supper. He had it all prepared. How many knows when Jesus does something, he does it right? Amen. He even teaches us when we go to do something, do it with all of our might. So I can just see all the napkins folded up, all the forks and the spoons in order. All the chairs have been prepared. No doubt he probably had a good meal cooked. I believe Jesus has got all the talent in the world. He's loaned us talents and called us to be stewards of the talents that he's blessed us with. So if I know that some of these restaurants on earth has got some good cooking, they only just got a portion of the, of the talent that Jesus got because Jesus owns the whole world the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof I don't know what type of food he had on that table and I don't believe it's going to be the food that we're going to be caring about it's going to be the fellowship with the most high God that's going to put an apron around his waist and serve us when we're supposed to be serving him praise God but regardless of the, of the time that he had spent and what all he had done to prepare for that supper the Bible said that he called a servant. And we know this is a parable, but Jesus has given us a story here to liken unto what the last days are going to look like when he calls his church to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what this whole parable is about. And some of you may say, what is a marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, the Bible teaches us that they're going to rapture the church out of here because we have not been appointed unto wrath. Some people say we're already going through the tribulation. We don't believe that. There's pre-tribulation people, mid-tribulation people, and post-tribulation people. Some people believe we're going to go through a little bit of it. Some people think he's going to come back at the end of it. But his word plainly tells us we have not been pointed unto wrath. I believe we're going to be caught up in the moment of a twinkling of an eye at the last trump and the dead in Christ will rise first and them which are alive remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be, believe, be with the Lord. I believe that that's my hope today that we have a blessed hope. Amen. That he's coming back. He said if I go to prepare a place for you that I'm coming and again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be I'm so thankful that he said keep your eyes toward the hills from whence cometh our help praise God but even in the midst of this preparation that God uh, Jesus Christ has has told us about the marriage supper of the lamb he's prepared this dinner he sends a servant boy out how many knows we're the servants he sent us out to tell the people about the Lord. How many has ever felt like this servant boy? Come back to tell the Lord some bad news. Lord, they don't want to come. They got a basketball game to go to this Sunday. Lord, they can't come. They got cows they got to tend to this Sunday. God, they can't come. They got the farm to tend to this Sunday. Lord, they can't come. They just got married. They own a hundred. How many has ever heard those excuses under the heaven? You know, I just had family. You know, and family is more important than church. Uh, come on, somebody. Jesus is teaching us right here. He was angry with these type of people. How many knows that judgment must first start in the house of God and that the righteous scarcely be saved? Where shall the ungodly in the center appear? I don't want to hold you under condemnation. You don't get to go to heaven because you appear to church. If that was the case the devil would go to heaven. He appears every time the doors are open. Even when the doors are closed, he's here. You don't get to go to heaven by how many times you attend church. But if you get born again, you'll want to go to church. If you can't even want to make it to church, how in the world you want to go to heaven for? Heaven's going to be like church. We're going to praise Him throughout eternity. We're going to give Him glory and honor throughout eternity. If you make up excuses about church, it's more likely you'll end up making up excuses about heaven. But Jesus had went through all the hustle and bustle. I remember times as a young preacher, my heart would be break to pieces as I would prepare for messages throughout the week and seek the Lord to come to a church service on Sunday morning and see a lot of empty pews. I can remember the, the, the youth leaders preparing and doing everything they can for the kids and I could see their hearts break as Saturday they took them to play, but Sunday there was not many there to pray. I would see their hearts discouraged. I would see the hearts of the choir discouraged as they spent hours 
hours and hours throughout the week preparing for their songs come Sunday that there may not be many ears to hear. I can even see the people who got the vacuum cleaners in their hands and the dusters in their hands and the mop buckets in their hands and vacuum and mopping and cleaning the church to only show up to a handful of people. Church, we're talking. The Spirit of the Lord is talking us to today that we're living in society that has turned their backs upon God. It's not time for us to look to the Democrat Party. It's not time for us to look to the Republican Party. It's our time to lift up our eyes and turn to the hills from whence cometh our help. The help's going to come from the church. What God does upon earth, He issues it through the church. You say, well, God don't need the church. You're absolutely right, but that's the body that He chooses to govern through. It's the church. He gives Peter a very strict order as he leaves earth. He says, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. They're looking to a vaccine for the answer. They're looking to the Republican Party for an answer. The Democratic, sure, they got the answer. They all got an answer and they got the wrong answer. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. And if there be any change in America, it's going to have to come through my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will he hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal our land. Amen. The church has the answer. Somebody shout the church. The church has the answer. All the preparation that people over the years have done to make preparations for church on Sunday. Made preparations to have service on Wednesday nights. I see that people have all types of excuses. And I can hear the Spirit of the Lord say this. Did I do all this for nothing? Did I prepare you a place and a table that's been reserved in heaven? Did I make you to inherit a blessing and reserved you a place in heaven for nothing? Sadly to say, there's many spots in heaven. How many knows he died for all? Ain't that what the word said? He didn't just die for the preacher man. He just didn't die for the church board. He died for the drunk that's on the bar stool. He he died for the harlot that's been through too many men. Come on, somebody. He died for the liar that don't know how to tell the truth. He died for the murder that's killed people. There's innocent blood that's been shed. He died for the homosexual. He died for the lesbian. He died for them all. He died once and he died for them all. Every sin that ever be committed was put on that body on that day on the cross and when the blood shed Jesus sighed a voice that said it is finished there will never be a soul born under the heavens that won't have enough blood to take care of their sins but sadly mistaken there will be enough of blood to keep them out of hell but they'll still trample over the blood of Jesus and go there anyhow And I hear the Spirit of God putting it in men and women's heart that preach the gospel to say, did did I do all this for nothing? How would it make you feel if you had a 16, sweet 16-year-old birthday party for your child and you've kept it secret from them? Boy, you've, you've done went all out. You've done prepared all kind of things. Got them a vehicle under the garage. Got it all hidden out. They don't know nothing about it. Just to find out that they've done made plans with their friends to go somewhere another else. You'd say, did I do all this for nothing? And you may be like me as a parent. You may say, I'm not going to give them a choice. They're going to come anyhow. But you see, Jesus ain't quite like that when it comes to salvation. He don't make nobody come To his supper. He says if you come. I want you to come on your own free will. Because if I make you. That's not truly love. How many has ever wanted to have something to do with your kids. But your kids didn't want to have nothing to do with you. You might can make them take out the trash. If your belt's big enough. You might can make them keep their grades up. If your belt's big enough. But your belt will never be big enough. To make them love you. Love is a choice. That someone has to, that's what real love is. There may be people who obey you, but just because they obey you don't mean they love you. Jesus says, I've prepared a dinner for this whole world that I so love the world that my Father gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is a place reserved in heaven that your name may be written down in the Lamb's book of life and God is standing at the door of our hearts today. He's knocking and He said, If any man come unto me, don't let him thirst. Praise God, I'll give him freely the drink of water of the water of life. Praise God. But where are the people? 
You say, Brother Brandon, it's a COVID-19 going on. I can understand that. And I've tried to be a good boy through this whole ordeal and not throw no stones at anyone. But what gets me is, just this past week, they opened a couple beaches back up. Some of you are aware of it. Some of them in Florida, I think it was. Maybe some of them in California. I'm not sure exactly where all they've opened them up at. But they've opened up a couple beaches. How many knows they're all over that beach? That saddened my heart. That saddened the spirit of God's heart this morning. You watch when church opens up, people are going to act funny. They're going to act funny, Brother Larry. They don't want to get inside because I might catch a germ. I tell you, Walmart hadn't lost no business. Walmart's packed from the front to the back. People's got to have toilet paper. People's got to have paper towels. they got to have food. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of the Lord says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. There's going to come a time, I'm led to believe everybody wants this coronavirus to leave, man. We're tired of staying at home, but I don't believe it's done the United States of America much good yet. I still see people hard-headed. I still see people trampling over the very thing that get them into the kingdom of heaven, the blood of Christ. I see people making a mockery out of God. We still got governors and we got leaders across this land that says that God is not the reason that it's slowing down, that they are for social distance. I want to tell you, the numbers have been stacking up while we've been staying at home. God forbid, I believe if we have repentance throughout this land, we would see a different. But who was the preacher man? No, the preacher man don't know nothing. God don't don't know none people throwing God to the side. But God is not a man that he should be mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. There have been a lot of people wonder why we're going through what we're going through. I've been preaching it for years. It's only a matter of time. You cannot marry man and man and put them in the house of God and think God's not going to throw his temper party at it. Amen. You cannot go go and put homosexuals on our main line to fight for our country's freedom and let homosexuals get behind the pulpit and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and think God's not going to get angry. You go back and read the Old Testament when he opened the earth up and swallowed up thousands of them at a time. Oh, but he's changed, Brother Brandon. My God doesn't change. He never changes. The only thing's changed is our covenant where we used to have to earn our salvation and do all the righteous we could possibly do to get into the kingdom of heaven. He has died to that covenant. He shed the blood for that covenant. Now there's only one way into the kingdom of heaven and somebody shout Jesus. Amen. He's the only way into heaven, but he still ain't changed. There's a lot of folk over the years that feel like since grace has came that we don't have to worry about sin no more, that he lowered the standard. But the Bible teaches us he raised the standard. He told us in the old time it was written, Thou shalt not commit adultery. What Jesus say? But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery. Amen. The Bible teaches us that if we're angry with our brother without a cause, we're in, we're in danger of judgment. Anger will send us to hell. All these things were sent us to hell, but there's one name under heaven whereby man shall be saved. And it's the name above all names. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess that He's Lord of all. Did I do all this for nothing? I hope you can pray. You can answer that today and pray that, God, I don't want to take the first thing you've done at Calvary for granted. I want to take just a moment to go back into these things that I've already touched on earlier. I know it may be leftovers for some of y'all, but maybe some of this is new to y'all. I pray that you'll get a blessing off of it. Sometimes it makes me cry. Sometimes I can't get through it to know what the Lord actually went through for somebody like me. But the night in the Garden of Gethsemane, if he's ever felt stress, the Bible said he was in such great distress that his sweat became great drops of blood. He was in such agony that his arrest by the Roman soldiers led him to Pilate's hall. You know the story. In the midst of Pilate's hall, he was tied to a post, more, more known as a whipping post. That these Roman soldiers would take a leather strap that had nine different strings on the end of it called a cat o' nine tails. I've always thought it meant cat of nine tails. But the word is actually cat o apostrophe nine cat o nine tails it was a it was a roman custom of that day to whenever they was to chastise somebody with a cat o nine tails they were to beat the people with 39 stripes the king james version used 40 save one 
39 stripes was to be placed upon the back of whoever that was a thief or whoever was caught. Jesus was tried as a prisoner. And how many knows he never done nothing to deserve anything? He, they, they let Barabbas go. They let the prisoner to go to take the one that was innocent, the one who never sinned. They put him on the whipping post. On each side of this string that came from this leather whip was bone fragments and metal pieces that was razor sharp. I watched somebody on YouTube this morning coming down here. Normally they only use knots on the end of these ropes because as they slap this leather band the knots itself would lacerate skin I can only imagine the metal pieces attached to the end the bone fragment now I know why the spirit of God at 2 o'clock in the morning would ask me did I do all this for nothing did I do all this that you might could ask Siri what was wrong with your body? Did I do all this that you might could pop a pill to try to find some uh, temporary relief? I say all that to say this the next time you're sick in your body. I'm not against going to doctors. Thank God for our doctors. But how about go to Jesus first? Don't go to Him trusting you, trusting Him with your prayers. Listen, this is very this is very serious this morning. I want you to get this. Don't go trusting Him with your prayers. Oh, don't go trusting Him how much I've read the Bible this week, how much I've fasted. All these things are good. But as you got Wednesday night's Bible study, if you didn't, you need to go back and listen to that. God gave me a revelation that I should have known when I first got saved. But sometimes self-righteousness can blind you of God's righteousness. And as we've been studying about the whole arm of God, that's the second armor that He told us to put on. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. We must guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You've got to watch out for false prophets in the end days. They will not preach you a false message that you think is false. The Bible said they're like, they're, they come to you with sheep's clothing, but inside they're revening wolves. Their message sounds sweet to the ears, enticing to the ears, but inside they're full of dead man bones. They're grave clothes. Amen. They're people with grave clothes on. Oh. Doctrines that will tell you, and we've been guilty of it ourselves. Boy, if you pray long enough, you'll get the breakthrough at midnight. I don't hear no amens no more. Boy, if we fast long enough, we'll get the breakthrough we're looking for. Anything wrong with praying long? Absolutely not. Anything with fasting long? Absolutely not. But do you see falling into that trap of self-righteousness? That means if you hadn't prayed long, you don't deserve to get healed in your body. I come to tell you that's a doctrine from the enemy. Jesus says, quit coming to me with how long you've prayed and you remember the stripes that I bore upon my back. That's how you get healed. That's how you receive something from the Lord. Can I go on into a little bit deeper? The Bible said that Jesus gave a parable that there was two men in the temple, did He not? He said the first one came and began to brag upon all the things that He'd done. And I do want to remind you that none of these things that He'd done was ungodly. All these things that He'd done, we need to practice on a, on a weekly basis. I believe it. He says, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like those other ones. I fast twice a week. In other words, you know, I don't know how, how much Jesus lays upon your heart to fast, but, you know, Jesus said if a, if a person asks to go a mile, go with him twain, go with him two. And this man here said, well, I went two times for you, Lord. I, I fasted two times for you. Can't you just hear that inner religious voice saying, boy, he's got it going on. That's the one I want praying for me. He's doing a lot of fasting, doing a lot of praying. I tell you what else he's doing. He's doing a lot of bragging. Amen. Oh, the second thing is the money thing. People nowadays think money can buy everything. I want to tell you, money can't buy you nothing in the kingdom of God. The reason you have money is because God's blessed you with money. Don't let money become your God. He said we cannot serve two gods. We'll either serve God or mammon. And that's money. That's, that's monetary uh, goods that are upon this earth is mammon. You can't serve them both. And the Bible said the other old man smote on his breast. 
He said, Lord, I ain't worthy to lift my eyes towards heaven. That's all he said. How many knows the second one went home justified rather than the first one did? Is my Bible reading correctly today? The second one went home justified. In other words, if you wanted somebody to pray for the healing of your body, Jesus said, get the second man to do it. He's more righteous than the first man because the first man's trusting in his own righteousness. The second man has seen that without Christ, I have no hope. In him is the hope of glory. We've got it all wrong, especially in the Pentecostal faith. We cannot get works mixed up with faith. It doesn't work. Faith produces works. Works don't produce faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, we can't go to a little lukewarm denomination where we think that God's grace is all it's about because it's not all about God's grace. You've got to put your faith in His grace or it won't work. Because God's grace is sufficient for all of us. But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That means carefully seeking out. The Bible said, If my people to call by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. There's too many people that are seeking God's hands, what God can give Him. But we ought to wake up in the mornings that we're not hurting and go to the Lord in prayer and thank God on the good days, not wait to the bad days before we call upon the name of the Lord. I believe that when we spend time with God on the good days, He's a very present help in the bad days. Amen. I believe He's a very present help in the time of trouble. So we got all that down pat. That is by the cross. They got tired of Paul preaching the cross. Paul seemed so simple. But Paul said the preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. If you're saved today, it's about the faith that you've put in the cross of Calvary. Amen? I want to tell you that if you're sick in your body today, the blood still works. The stripes He bore on His body still works. Don't give up on Him. You say, doctors have told me this, doctors have told me that. Praise God for our doctors. A lot of people say doctors are not a sin because they had Luke the physician, one of the disciples. I never thought doctors were a sin. I don't know where that came from. But I want to remind you that everywhere that Luke followed Jesus, Luke never recorded any healings of his own. Oh, you ain't going to talk to me now. You got quiet. Luke never prescribed a medication to help anybody out. Whenever Luke followed Jesus, Luke got out of the way and said, Lord, you do the work. I'm just tag along. I'm just a follower. And I believe when doctors get back to the place in their life that they'll get out the front line and put Jesus on the front line. And before they put their hands to a knife to cut on your body, say, can I ask a prayer before we go into that surgeon room? We won't see no change. And our doctors, a lot of doctors out there just out there for the money. But there's a lot of them out there for good, good reasons. And you'll find out the ones that are hirelings and the ones that are out there for real in a time like this. Because if they're just there for the money, they're going to get on out of there right now because there's a lot of danger to be in the hospitals right now. But how many is thankful for our heroes that does go out there and do their very best to risk their lives? Amen. Thank God for our nurses. They go out there and risk their lives day in and day out trying to do their best to help this world. And don't you take me the wrong way and say I'm against doctors. I'm not. But I'm just saying, doctor is a man, a woman. We shouldn't look into man's hands to provide for us all the time. If it comes through man's hands, then praise God for it. But God doesn't have to use man all the time. He can use a donkey. He can use anything he wants just as long as God uses. How many cares who it comes through as long as you get healing in your body? Amen. If it comes through an Advil, praise God. If it comes through a prayer, laying on of hands, the oil putting on my head, praise God. All I want to do is be healed in my body. And you don't need to lay there. The, 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 the point of this message is you don't need to lay there with no hope and say, well, I'm going to die now. The doctors say there's no hope left. Whose report will you believe? That's what Isaiah said. Whose report will you believe? 
I firmly, 110% believe in divine healing today. You're looking at a man today that should be dead. And my parents know it. My friends know it. They was around me at a time. I even told my mama one day, if I die, don't worry about me because I'm ready to go. I knew without a shadow of a doubt I was born again. I knew without a shadow of a doubt I had been Holy Ghost filled. The power of God hit me one night in my road while I was seeking God. And if you've never had the power of the Holy Ghost to touch you, I don't care if you claim it Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, you need to be filled with the Spirit. If you've never been filled with the Spirit, I want to urge you today and compel you to seek Him while He may be found. There's no under feeling under heaven that when the power of the Holy Ghost touches your body. I don't want to go into doctrinal arguments, but trust me, there is a certain thing of being filled with the Holy Ghost. I didn't believe it. I wasn't raised up Pentecostal. wasn't raised up in church, period. But what little time we did go to church, it definitely was not a Pentecostal. I was told them folks was crazy. And when I went to join the church and the pastor came out there with these bylaws that said you had to believe in speaking in tongues, I told my wife, we're getting out of here. But listen, quit worrying about what Joe Blow said or Mama said or Daddy said or Uncle said or Aunt said. Taste of the Lord your own self. The Word of God said that there's a power from on high. And Jesus said, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with this power from on high. Did I do all this for nothing? Last but not least, some people say, that, and I just quoted the scripture in the King James Version about 40 stripes save one, 39 stripes. But if I did my math right, and you can go back and check me out. If you take 39 stripes and you times it times 9, I think that came up to 351. So besides Jesus Christ taking 39 stripes on His back, it was 351 lacerations that He took upon His back. This man on YouTube, you can go and Google it, he took a dead hog body, I think it was, skinned the body that His flesh may be like our flesh. He reared back with just ropes and beat the rope, beat the hog body like it was a real body. And just the rope with knots on it would tear the meat off. Could you imagine? No wonder I think it's Isaiah, maybe the 50, uh, 54th chapter, somewhere around the 12th, 13th verse, something like that. Maybe in 17th verse. But Isaiah prophesied all this before Jesus came. He said this, that his visage would be marred more than any man. Now that word visage means what he looked like. I believe when they got through with Jesus Christ on the post in, the, in, the, in Pilate's hall, I believe his back was unrecognizable. And Jesus come here to, sent me here today to tell you, if you're sick in your body, don't you give up because doctors say you can't make it. Don't you give up because your body's hurting. You look unto those stripes and say, God, help me with my faith. I believe, Lord, but help me with my unbelief that I may not let you do all what you've done for nothing. I want to receive the healing that you paid for it, Calvary. Will you try? That's all. I'm not asking. I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying you're not doing it right. I'm doing it right. I'm not saying none of that. All I'm asking you is to try. Go on. Don't worry about how good you pray or how loud you pray or how hard you pray. If slobber's flying, if you sound spiritual, you can go as a little child and just simple. That's, that's how you're going to get your prayers answered anyhow. Simple childlike faith and say, Father, I'm tired of being sick in my body. And my preacher man told me today that your word said that you came to heal me. You have got to first believe it is always God's will to heal you. If Satan can talk you out of that, he's got you. Because you can't believe in something that you don't know that always happens. You'll throw it up in the air and say, well, if it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't. We'll win her either way. You can't have that religious type mentality just because you've prayed for people sincerely and they've died. Yes, I've prayed for people and they've died, but I've also prayed for people and they was healed. You say, Brandon, ain't that confusion? How do you believe every time that you pray that people's going to be healed? I believe because God told me to believe. And that's all I've got to do is my part. 
I don't get in God's business wondering why He heals some and wonder why He don't. There may be a string of things out there that could be hindering that that I don't got time to go into. But if you're sincere today and you're sick in your body, maybe you're scared. Hey, there was two things He paid for in Pilate's Hall. You ready for it? The chastisement of our peace. Somebody say peace. Was upon Him. And with His stripes, we were healed. The stripes were for your peace and they were for your healing. Did he do all that for nothing? That's, that's a question for us today. Are you allowing his healing virtue to flow in your life? Or you let the devil... Because listen to me. Whenever Satan came in Friday night, there's two things that Satan's going to do most of the time. He's going to attempt to take your healing and he's going to attempt to take your peace in the same essence. Because when my healing began to leave my body and I began to hurt, the first thing brought about me was fear. I started doubting. I had no clue what was going on with my body. But then the Spirit of the Lord came in. The Bible said when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. I come to tell you, you are not in this battle alone. You don't have to fight your fight. All you fight is a good fight of faith the battle is not yours the battle is the Lord's and I grant you when it comes time to fighting if you've been doing your warfare and going into your closet in your secret place of the most high there will be a line of the tribe of Judah that will war up and say that's my child and you can't put your hands on my child aren't you glad to be a child of the king last but not least as he left that hall they made them tow the cross. I just got through doing a swing set for my wife that were six by six post. I think they were 12, 14 foot long, 12 foot maybe. And I had to pick one of those six by sixes up by myself. That may have been where some of the pain come from. Who knows? But them six by six posts are heavy. These posts that held these people up was heavier than that. You had two beams of wood, size one beam of wood. This man has already lost piles of blood and water. Your body is consumed of water and blood. Through the beating of the lacerations of the 351 stripes upon his back, he's already close to death. He's about done bled to death. The water's drained out of his body. He's dehydrated. Muscles have begun to cramp by then. Shock has, has touched his body. And now he's asked to tote a cross up the hill. I've preached a lot of messages over the years, very few that I can remember. But there's one that I can remember very distinctly here at Oak Grove Assembly of God. And it was this, that Jesus Christ, as he went up Calvary's hill, that the Bible said that there was a man called Simon the Cyrenian that was along the wayside. And as he went about going up that hill, he collapsed from the, 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 the weight of the cross. And he had to have Simon the Cyrenian to help tote his cross. I come to tell us today if the son, the, the, the son of God, the sinless Lamb of God, if he had to have somebody help tote his cross, there will be times in our life where our bodies feel like we can't take it no more. And don't you be so arrogant that you think you going to do this thing by yourself there's going to be always provision God will send somebody by to help tote your cross can I get an amen this morning there will always be people with pride that says no I'll get it people don't like help no I'll get it I'll get it if God sent you somebody by to help you out you better receive that blessing if you can't walk somebody tries to open up your door I was in the middle of Hardy's one day in line there was a man that was on a on a um, crutch. Broke his leg, had a cast on his leg, and there he was trying to, if you know anything about crutches, I don't, I don't know much about them, but them things look like they're hard to walk on. And he was in line trying to get his food and his bag and his drinks and trying to hold that and open up the door, and I went over there, the Lord told me. He ought not have to have the Lord tell you something like that. I said, man, let me help you out. No, I got it. I said, no, man, oh, I got it. <laughs> I said, well, help yourself then, friend. I seen him struggling, trying to put one foot out, trying to uh, push the, the uh, crutch to try to hold it open. He's already hobbling on one foot. He just about fell because of pride. Didn't want nobody to hold the door open for him. If God blesses you with somebody to come by and help, you ought to receive that blessing. And thank God he's provided you somebody. Up the hill he goes with the help of Simon Serenian. This is where the sad part comes. Because there's a lot of people that are that'll 
sacrifice for you. Billy Ray Cyrus had a song years ago, and even when I was lost and undone, it seemed like military songs would always bring chills to my body. Even when I didn't know nothing about the Spirit of God, but when they would sing the national anthem, they would stand up and put, take their hats off their head. It still brings pride to my heart to know that we're living in a country. This one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. How many is thankful to live in the United States of America? Amen. There's a lot of people that wants to know why I'm so, uh, I go the extra mile for military forces. I pray for them all the time. Because there's people out there today that's got no leg. They got blowed up in a mine somewhere or another. That I might go home, Brother Larry, and lay my head upon my pillow tonight in peace and in safety. But you know, even more than that, Billy Ray Cyrus' song said, All gave some, some gave all. Some stood through, true to the red, white, and blue. Some had to fall. Brother Jeff, he didn't just give just a little bit in Pilate's Hall. There's a lot of people that will go a little ways for the Lord and then they turn their back when the going gets tough. I think of the time that Brother Jeff and Miss Mary has recorded our services, of the times around the table. How many has got some fond memories around the table? All you people whose belly hangs over your belt loop ought to be blowing about right now. You didn't get that belly for nothing. There's been some fond times around the table. Memories. But the sad thing about it, Brother Larry has mentioned before, whenever Jeff and them plays that on them screens, normally it's years or two later for certain situations or occasions. The sad thing about it was those people that was on those pictures, a lot of them they ain't here no more. Some of them's died. Some of them's backslidden. Don't just go a little ways for the Lord. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Amen? Go all the way for Jesus. It may be hard, but if Jesus could do it, we can do it too. Because all things are possible through Christ which strengthens us. As He co towed to that cross up that hill, we see a lot of pictures that's portrayed of Jesus with, nail, with prints of nails in His hands. Rightfully so. The Word of God speaks about prints in His hands. Thomas the one we call Thomas the Doubter snuck in after he didn't see the Lord and, and told the Lord, unless I see the prints in your hand and the prints in your side where they pierced you and I won't believe. And he reached forth his hand. But as scholars have researched over the years, I do believe what the scholars say, not over the Word of God. I just believe the Word of God may have had it translated a little bit different. But there was no possible way that nails could hold his hand because of the weight of his body would tear his hand, slap off. But at the bottom of his hands, where your wrist at, there's a couple nerves that go through there. And I don't know where they got the name funny bone from, but it's not funny when you hit that nerve. If you've ever had a nerve pinched, if you've ever hit your funny bone, you know the electrical field that goes through your body. But these people that were being crucified would have a nail stuck through their wrist at the bottom of their hand. Because that would be more cartilage and more weight to hold the weight of the body as he hung upon the cross. The feet would be turned slightly to the side, slanted, with their knees together, with a nail going through them. The reason they would be turned to the side, so they couldn't press up. And as they hung them on the cross, especially one like Jesus that had already suffered so much blood loss and water loss, as they hung him on the cross, his muscles would already be dehydrated. And in order to live a while on the cross, you had to have every muscle of your body working. Because it was up to your muscles to keep from smothering yourself to death. But as his body was already beaten and torn, you know what he was doing? He was preparing a supper for us. And the Bible says that while he hung upon that cross, he cried, Lama, Lama Sabachthani, which means... Or Eli, Eli, Lama Sabastana, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There will be times when it feels like the Father is not hearing our prayers. But I come to tell you, church, hold on, that He is our beloved. Come on, somebody. And in Him is our God well pleased. Yeah. 
Scholar would say when muscles begin to dehydrate, that they would quit working. That would cause the release of the muscles. And as the muscles released in the arms, the shoulders would tear loose from the socket. And as the shoulders tore loose from the socket, that would put pressure on the torso, which is your chest area, chest cavity, where you breathe from. And as all that weight was upon it and you begin to smother, they would take their feet in their last, their last resort of breathing and begin to push up to try to get more air to come into their lungs. But by that time, there would be so much shock that is set into their bodies that their, their, their heart would be, begin to fill with fluid from heart failure. And eventually their legs would cramp. Their legs would grow weak. And as they let down pressure on their legs, suffocation from the fluid that his body had already produced from congestive heart failure would be like sips of air that he got to breathe. What did he do that for? He did that that an old sinner boy like me could come to know his love. I'm thankful that he introduced me to his son. I know him today. I've taken his full pardon of sin. I don't trust in my righteousness. I want to say this in my closing today. There's a lot of people who struggle. I'm supposed to be going and talking to somebody this evening that's struggling. There's a lot of people that, that I even explained perfectness on the, on the website Wednesday night on our online service. There's a lot of people go around saying, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I wish you would stop saying that. Because in Christ, you are perfect. Your spirit is perfect. It'll never be no more perfect, your spirit. Now, your flesh, that's where we get, that's where we get all messed up at. Because in our flesh, we still do some crazy stuff. In our flesh, we still fall. In our flesh, we still make mistakes. In our flesh, we're not perfect yet. Amen. And some people get confused over that. And they start seeing imperfection come out of their flesh. And they get confused. Uh, but let me tell you something. If you get Him on the inside of you, your body will be progressively sanctification through your flesh all the days of your life. You should see a difference in your lifestyle from the time you came to know Christ and the time today that you live. If you don't see a difference, I'm not going to say you're not saved, but I'm going to say this. You're looking into the wrong place. If you begin to look at Calvary and the price He paid on the cross, I grant you, I guarantee you, that you'll begin to see a difference in your body. I used the parable of this that the Lord showed me. I just planted a garden, first garden I planted in a while. If you get that seed on the inside of that soil, there may be days and there may be weeks you see no sign of change. But how many knows it's changing? It's changing. It's cultivating. And although you put that seed in there, there still takes some effort and some work after that from you and from God. You've got to go out there and water it. You've got to keep it alive. You've got, to, you've got to go out there and hold a garden a little bit. You've got to keep the grass out of it. You've got to keep all the stuff out of it. But let me tell you something. It, 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 it mainly uh, depends upon the sunshine and the rain we get from heaven. I believe it like this. If you do all you can, He'll do what you can't do. You put forth your effort and God will bless your effort and you'll begin to grow. But could you imagine trying to go or grow a garden on your own? Trying to come up with your own sunshine? Could you see yourself out there with a little blow dryer trying to give it heat? Wouldn't work, would it? There's a lot of people trying to heal their bodies like that. They're trying to heal their bodies with their own righteousness. There's a time that we got to enter into His rest and say, Lord, I've done all. And the Bible said, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. And having on the full armor of God. Praise God. Your body will change. Your life will change. He that's in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But what Satan wants us to do when our flesh begins to fail is just go on and give up. Don't you give up. The Bible said if we'll walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In our flesh, there's no good thing. But on the inside of us, if we've trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're born again. We have a new man, the inner man, the Bible calls. And though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day 
by day. You've got to renew that man. You've got to renew that mind. You've got to come out from among the world. Be you separate. He's not going to lead you in the same path everybody else goes. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And there's only a few that enters in there. At. Amen? Amen? I want to leave you with this question today. If you're lost, some of that blood that was shed on Calvary is going to be wasted. Because that blood's for you. That blood's for me. You say, I ain't good enough. I've done a lot of bad things. Please take that and just throw it out of your mind right now. That has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is if you'll receive what Jesus done at Calvary. And that's it. We always want to add to it, but that's it. There's been times in my self-righteousness days that I wanted to add to confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, but that's it. If it would have been more, he would have wrote more, but that's it. If we'll confess Him with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with mouth does man confess into the heart he believes. Do you believe today that Jesus suffered that horrendous death that your sins could be blotted out, your transgressions could be washed away? Do you? Or are you trying to live holy enough to get His forgiveness? Where do you stand out with God today? The Sadducees and the Pharisees were religious people of the day. You know what? They done good. They fasted twice a week. They prayed. They gave alms. But do you know that if they did not accept Jesus as Christ as sacrifice on the cross at Calvary, that all them good works that they've done will not help them on Judgment Day? When God passes by your house on Judgment Day, there's one thing that He's going to be looking for, and He's going to be looking for the blood to be applied to your doorpost. It's the only thing that works. It's the only thing that ever has worked. There's the only thing that ever will work. If you're sick in your body today, God said, did I do all that for this? He's got a place prepared for us to eat supper with Him. He wants to invite you, and He wants to challenge us to go out there and invite others to come and enjoy the supper that He has prepared. Amen. Let's all bow our heads today. Father, I thank You for the great privilege of preaching this great message, this gospel, the good news, glad tidings that You came into this world and You came into Your own, but Your own received You not. But as many came to You, and I pray that there's many online, there's many today that are coming to You and say, Oh man, if that's all you got to do, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord today. And if they fall and they backslide and the enemy tells them they've messed up too much, there's no way back to You, Lord, that You would just go and, and, and help them to come to their senses today, Lord, that they may leave that hog pen. They they might come back home. Lord, and I pray that the church will be just like the Father that's on the porch, that we'll run out there and uh, they tell us not to embrace them right now, but nevertheless, whatever you lay upon our hearts, God, to embrace them and to love them and let them know we're thankful not to remember all their sins that they spent time in the hog pit, not to remember their sins of Egypt, but know that this covered on the blood, that there's so much power in that blood, that as far as the east is from the west, to never be remembered no more, so far as our transgressions have been removed for us. Thank you today, Lord. Help us to serve you with gladness and come before your presence with singing and help us to make a joyful noise unto you all the lands Lord help us to be a joyful people when people miss, meet us throughout the week that we may be some of the happiest people that they would ever want to meet God that we bring laughter to people and joy to people's hearts forgive us Lord for where we fail you at and help us not to fail you no more progressively sanctify us Lord Take the sin that's out of our lives. Search our hearts that there may not be no blackness with inside of us. There may not be no darkness inside of us. Lord, but let that light shine that all people may see our good works and glorify you that is in heaven. We love you and we thank you for this day that you have helped us made. If there's anybody sick among us, God, I pray this message has encouraged them not to go to their prayer life today and see how long they can pray this evening. But go and just simply come before you as a child and say, Lord, your word said, by your stripes I was healed. And in my spirit I'm already healed. But in my body I feel bad. In my body I'm weak. In my body I can't get it right. Lord, would you help me to put my faith in that stri them stripes that you bore upon your body. And Lord, help us to begin to think about what you went through. Picture it in our mind. Meditate upon it in our minds. And bring faith to fruition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, how many enjoyed service today? We'll be back next Sunday, 1030. Invite somebody to come with you. Wouldn't it be nice to fill this parking lot up during the midst of a pandemic? I believe he can do it. God bless you.